My name is Kimberly Tate Malone, and I'm one of the reference librarians here at the library. So I'm so glad you're able to join us, because we in the library see this series as an extension of our charge to promote freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. So regardless of whether you group everything here in this room, see on your ballot, or reading the books on our shelves, we want you to have access to a wide range of viewpoints so that we can all learn and grow from each other. So I hope that we have a lively discussion today. And I want to I want you to join me in welcoming our presenter for the day, Velma Valoria, former state representative. Velma, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me here this morning. I just wanted to check in with you. Um, how many of you are voters? Oh good. And how many have voted? I'm doing it today. <laughs> So let me tell you what, uh, why, you know, why I think voting is really important. And I, you really have to just kind of um, think about it in terms of what is important to you. Like how many of you care about the environment? How you in this room? Do you know that there's an initiative regarding carbon tax to help the environment on the ballot? And what would that do? because a lot of people of color think that we should be voting no because it's going to take away something like $800 million from the budget and that some of that money could be used for things that our communities may need. Um, it might, they might take it away from, you know, um, help with housing or, you know, help with education, you know, a lot of human services. But there's a lot of people who are saying, hey, you know, now is the time. When are we going to do it if we don't do it now? So it's really, you know, it's really up to you and, you know, the kind of uh, perspective that you would have. But what I wanted to tell you is just like my experience. And um, so I got involved, I, I grew up during the um, Vietnam War. And I got involved in politics because I didn't like the U.S. foreign policy. A lot of my classmates, were moving to Canada because they didn't want to get drafted to fight in a war that they did not create, right? And so then I started to get involved to protest the war. And then pretty soon, the United States extended their foreign policy to declare dictatorship in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, in Haiti, and then they touched the Philippines. And I said, there's no way you're going to do so I got involved in the anti-Marcos dictatorship. And I worked really hard with an organization that fought for peace and social justice. And then um, we worked to get rid of the Marcos dictatorship, pull out the US bases from the Philippines. The whole time, the way we did it was just not from community organizing, was from the voters. We talked to each and every single voter and we said, you gotta go talk to your congressman. You gotta tell them to pull out of the Philippines. You gotta tell them to stop the war because your vote counts. And that's how, that's how we began to create this peace and social justice movement around the world, right? And it became kind of like this real international movement. Pretty soon, the United States felt the pressure. And pretty soon they started to withdraw from the U.S. <coughs> from, the Philippine Bay, but, you know, from the basis. And then pretty soon the Marcus dictatorship got kicked out. <coughs> and then we had a democracy in the Philippines. That's how powerful your voice is. I'll give you another example. Got elected into office, right? In 1995, three Filipino women were murdered inside the King County Courthouse. <coughs> we thought it was just an issue of domestic violence. But when we looked at the people that were being, uh, that got murdered, 
one of them was what we call the male of the bride, right? And then pretty soon another male of the bride gets murdered, this time at the University of Washington. She was a student from Kyrgyzstan. They found her grave in her uh, husband's property. So we're trying to figure out, you know, we need to, to figure out what is causing all these people to leave their country, marry somebody who they don't hardly know, right? Move into a country where they don't speak their language and they have no support system. We call that the push and the pull factor. They get pushed out of the country from where they come because of the economic situations there. They get pulled into the country like the United States because they think there's a brighter future. Little do they know that they're in a relationship that's abusive and then it causes them also to get escalated and get murdered. When that happened, we looked at it from the Filipino community perspective and we said, you know, there's something going on here and it's broader than domestic violence. We had this woman do a, do a research paper and she called it bride trafficking. When we got that word bride trafficking, we linked it to what was happening um, internationally and we linked it to human trafficking. And when that human trafficking, uh, the linkage to human trafficking mm -hmm. happened, Washington State did not have any piece of legislation that would make human trafficking a crime. So guess what we had to do? We had to create legislation, right? But in 1983, there weren't that many people that knew about human trafficking. We had to do a big, broad education. And then in 1995, when I was trying to put forward the legislation, we had like a Republican House of Representatives. And so it, you know, so the, I couldn't get it out. Then pretty soon we elected and it became a 48-48 tie. And then it became like a 49, you know, and then pretty soon we set a 49-49 tie. And then pretty soon it got to 50 Democrats and then 48 Republicans, right? If I was to put forward this piece of legislation <coughs> to make human trafficking a crime, and I didn't get all the Democrats, I could lose that piece of legislation. One vote, one vote would have killed the whole thing. So guess what I did? I went to my Republican colleague and I said, help me out, what do I need to do? You know what she told me? She said, Velma, go to a prayer group that the Republican women are having. It's on Friday nights. Do you know how to do the rosary? I said, yeah, I'm Catholic, you know. <laughs> I go I go do my rosary. She said, go, go to that prayer group. I went to the prayer group. Didn't say anything about my bill. The following day, I went to all those Republican women. And I asked them, would you sign on to this bill? It's about human trafficking. It's the experience that our community had with this whole issue regarding the male or the bride. A domestic violence issue that we thought was just domestic violence that led into you know, something else. Every single one of those Republican women signed on to that bill. And when it went out onto the house floor, it went out with 98%. We created the first bill in the nation to make human trafficking a crime on the state level. 48 other states have now followed us. Washington State is a leader in the anti-trafficking arena. So, what do you think about your vote? I agree with what you were saying that you know vote has power. <coughs> but I think it ultimately comes down to what the legislation on ballot is. So like you talked about the carbon initiative, right? Mm -hmm. um, it also like takes out um, 
goods and manufacturing tax for Boeing and you know all other big employees. Mm -hmm. That needn't, you know, that should have been on this, you know, and, and the initiative. Yeah. And so that's the controversy. That's why people need to know and understand some of these initiatives. Because that's the controversy. If you take away all those taxes from those different corporations, it creates a um, downturn in our um, revenue. And then it would also create an impact on those that are most affected. So there is that, you know, like whether you're for it or against it. And it depends on where you stand. So you need to understand those issues. Right? One of the other things, because I work on the issue of domestic violence, there's, I, I have to take a look at my cheat sheet, but there's this um, initiative 1491. Do you know what that one is about? It's about taking away the right of a person to, to have arms if they are found to be um, unstable and may cause harm to other people. Which initiative? 1491. It says it's issued at it, extreme risk protection orders. Excuse me, if anybody wants to mark up a voter's booklet right here. Oh, yeah. <coughs> so 1491 would, would temporarily prevent somebody um, from causing harm to themselves they were found that you know, they were of extreme risk, and it would only be for one year. So I'll, I'll give you a, another example. I had a friend who was, um, her, she and her husband were having a difficult time, and her husband had a real hard time, and um, they got into an argument, and pretty soon it escalated, and the guy shot her, and then himself. If we were able to um, tell, because most families tell that you know some someone is escalating their their violence, then there's there's a way that they can go to the family or to a court and say we think that this person is going to cause harm to himself or you know to other members, and we would like to have an order to you know, look at a way. So that's initiative 1491. And then I have this favorite initiative. How many of you know about um, 1433? How many of you know about that? This is really important. You guys need to know about it. Because you know why? It's going to increase your minimum wage. Oh yeah, that, huh? <laughs> Remember 1433s. It's difficult to remember all the numbers. The number. <laughs> it's easier to remember. Yeah, it's difficult. But if you there. say raising the minimum wage, but you have to understand the, you have to remember the numbers because that's what's on the ballot. Okay. So those are really important. So by the way the initiative goes is that over the next four years, you know, your the the salary will increase so that by 2020, you you know, people would be getting 1320. In Seattle, it's a little bit higher, but it will not impact Seattle. It will impact those that are you know outside of the $15 minimum. So when we have the increase in Seattle, 15, everywhere else by 2020 will. Beginning the 13, 15? No, right, yeah. yeah. Okay. But right now, I think Seattle has the 15. Yes. Or 13. Yes. 13. Yeah. 15, 15, sorry. And it's actually worth more than the, what, the dollar amount that it will come up to because another piece of that initiative is providing paid. Mm -hmm. Hi, yeah, and yeah. And that's worth it. So that, yeah, so that's yeah. worth it. So that you can, you know, that, that adds, like, for every 40 hours that you work, you get one hour of paid time and um, sick leave. So, so, yeah, it will add up to more. So that's why, you know. And then, you know, what's really <coughs> hard is that, you know, trying to put it into the, in, into the legislature was really difficult. So they have to put it in front of the people and say, hey, you guys make the decision. But it will be statewide. 
okay? You know, other initiatives, do you know other initiatives that we should be voting for? Um, there's the lobbyist vote. So oh, tell us about that one. Um, this is really important because I'm also a lobbyist. <laughs> <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> um, so, from what I understand from the initiative is that we would get like a $50, almost like a credit. Um, so instead of lobbyists and candidates will go door to door canvassing almost to get you know, more money. And so we will get like a credit from um, state funding to choose which candidate we're going to go to. Because some lobbyists will have more money than others or some candidates will have more money than others. So um, they have more money going into that. So you get more commercials, um, more campaigning for that particular person. And they don't really need to get fair for others. Kind of yeah, so this yeah. would so, so this would, would make it more fair. Going. And yeah. also, you're not spending your money like this is government funding going into the campaign. So where's the money going to come from? That's a good question. Oh. It's something about <laughs> What initiative? It's what number? 1464. There you go. 1464. Right. Yeah. It would, oh, it would take away the sales. It would come from sales tax? Sales tax. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what it would. I have a question because mm -hmm. a large part of what I was wondering how responsive voters would be with their credit, um, and if any other state has a measure like the one that's being proposed. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any kind of idea of what the numbers would be for people to actually use their voucher, their government voucher. Oh, um, that I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm curious. They, they, you're saying they won't use it even yeah, if they got the voucher. Yeah, I feel like they would silo people even further from uh, knowing all of the issues. Mm -hmm. They have a wide range of um, different kinds of legislation, even though money is a big part in how. I mean, it's just a big part of how anything works. So mm -hmm. there are organizations that, that I am more inclined to vote for because they have a bigger Some of you will be legislators, others of you will be the Republican, 
and then the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And so um, then there will be people that will come and testify. So what I want to do, I'm not going to use 1433, but I'm going to use this, this um, Citizens United campaign. So I, I, need, I need some of you to be pro and some of you against. And then I need some of you to come and testify in front of the legislators. So the legislators would be me, Patty, and Kimberly. Okay. So, so gather together. I'll, I'll give you 15 minutes. Which are you going to Citizens United. They are. So are we proponents of being a proponent of repealing And then if you're. So this side would be repealing Citizens United. Okay. This side of the room would be in favor of Citizens United. Okay. Are you in favor? one person to come and testify in front of the legislators. You have to choose one person to come and testify in front of the legislators. So there will be two people testifying, one pro, one con. Three legislators will be listening to your arguments and we will be asking questions. Okay? We're talking about the Supreme Court decision. Yes. Yes. Okay, so you guys got to... Uh -huh. So the Citizens United... I can do either way. Or can you tell us what it is? The Citizens United... Okay. So I, why don't you... Why don't you... Why don't you... Uh, the Citizens United decision was by the Supreme Court about five years? Oh, 20... No, 2011. 2011. 2010. So, so, okay. So in 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court made a decision to say that corporations are people. So that then they can give unlimited. Um, okay. So you now have to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so this initiative, initiative, initiative 735, okay. would would go back to um, the, to Congress and they will ask um, the state to repeal this decision. Okay. I'm a proponent. So this is repealing. This is in favor. This is kind of like an even. I need a few of you more to come this way. I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. You'll be for maintaining. How about you? You maintain too? Are you going to maintain the Supreme Court decision? <laughs> then you're on this side. No, we're repealing it. Well, we're the opponent of repealing it. We're going to say yes to that initiative. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Oh, okay. Okay, so you guys got to talk us. You got to talk about why you're repealing it. And then you got to talk about who is going to represent you in front of the legislature. Same thing here. Okay? Fine. You're all in favor of Initiative 735. In favor means you're in favor of maintaining the Supreme Court's position. So you need to make arguments about why you want to keep it. Make a decision which of you is going to testify. Have your talking points. And then in, in 10 minutes. The scrutiny itself. So by 11.35, you should be, at uh, 12.35, you should be ready.
I give all the noise down to the bottom. So, say that perversions are as individuals, and that's just so they can be. I've seen that on a small point of view. That's what it is. Um, very clearly in the midst of something which is a non human entity over the interest of human beings because that is doing, you know, cooperation with the terms that you can see. Right. That is like, you know, itself is problematic in the sense that, well, now we are like, you can override the cost of the system because it's cooperating with the terms that you can see. No, I don't think it's like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 The argument for Like in this ballot, you know, there's no rent control, you know, um, 
same state wide or even within the CIA, you know, something which everybody wants to see out there, but that's a so non valid you know, so that is way uh, profitable thing, you know, for all the legislators, you know, lobbyists who are in Colombia. Oh, come on, you need practice. <laughs> no, I don't. 
Who's going to speak? Okay. Right up here. And from your side? You're Okay. You're the legislator. No, you're the legislator. Initiative. It's in vital to it is vital to repeal the Supreme Court's decision in uh, Citizens United. Um, essentially, at the basis of it's incredibly uh, it's undemocratic. It's not represent the will of the people. It equates money with free speech, um, which is not what free speech um, entails. Money does not equate to uh, free speech. And so, by repealing the Supreme Court's decision, we give the power back to individuals to ensure that every voice does matter and every vote does count, um, and to get the big business out of uh, infiltrating our legislative and democratic process. It's important to do this because realizing that um, state legislators already have to spend, or U.S. legislators already have to spend seven times about $7,000 a day fundraising to get reelected uh, by allowing corporations to give unlimited amounts of money, it would uh, impede the legislators to represent the interests of their constituents, and rather it would uh, further let self special interests into our democratic system and make legislators in our, our representatives more inclined to uh, the interests of large corporations. Uh, not only large U.S. corporations, but also large um, multinational corporations. And that is not in the best interest of the U.S. or the world. Do you have any questions? The, the underlying desire um, to, to repeal this, but is this initiative actually going to be effective? What will it, what it, will would, it result in? It would bring Washington State in solidarity with mm -hmm. the 650 municipalities that have already passed this legislation, mm -hmm. and it would also, uh, with also the other 16 states that have also passed um, this initiative, in the state of Washington as well, um, at a statewide, county, and city level, we have uh, caps on how much uh, corporations can give to camp campaigns and candidates. So it's not the voice of uh, Washington um, and the values that the state has. Um, and so it is in the best interest that we as a state join um, our other states and municipalities to repeal uh, the Supreme Court decision. So even if Washington State passed this initiative, would you need more than 17 or 18 states to pass it? Well, right now, 80% of Democrats and 83% of Republicans at the national level agree to repeal Citizens United. So if Washington, um, as a whole state, repeat, decides to repeal Citizens United, it would just allow our, our national representatives to further the fight and um, have confidence that they would get reelected because if they were to repeal Citizens United, because they have the confidence of their constituents that this is what constituents would do. I do have one question. So are you aware that once um, 
the uh, a constitutional amendment to the federal constitution is on the table, anything in the constitution can be amended at that time. But we're not discussing amending the constitution. We're, we're, we're discussing uh, repealing the Citizens United decision that equates money to free speech. Except the initiative proposes an amendment to the constitution. No, 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 constitutional. It's asking our state representatives to put pressure, I mean, to, on, our, on our, our federal reps from the state to put pressure to open up the Constitution for, for a constitutional amendment. And that can be a very tricky business. However, if we pass this in, in mind that we want to keep money out of our political system, and the value of this initiative I think that's kind of, it, it could be a snow, I think that's a, a scare tactic and a, and a little bit more of a snowballing effect rhetoric because if we say we want to uh, readdress a judicial decision in 2011 and then our entire uh, legislative process and our nation's constitution is at risk, I think that's just fear mongering. The essence of this bill and the point and the objective of it is to repeal Citizens United. So I think our, I think I, as a voter, I have confidence in our national representation that they would keep in mind the value and the, um, just the, the, the value of the, or the value of, yeah, initiative 735. Okay, thank you. Sir. All right, so starting off, I'll explain how not only is this legislation not viable for Washington and, and Washington DC in a sense, I'll explain why it also doesn't make sense, and then I'll go ahead and conclude and talk this up. So it really starts off with a single state cannot push an agenda for an entire nation. That's simply absurd in itself. Uh, the majority of the state should never decide or even start to interject what an entire nation should do that is stepping outside of the entire constitutionality of the United States as a whole for a single state to try and be superior to any other state and suggest that legislation should be heard. Now, it can be heard and it can be pushed through representatives and we have an electoral process already in place for that. That's why we elect representatives to push agendas for that we as voters see fit. So we as the voters can see fit to actually push this through our representatives and can do that. That's actually the route that's already in place. So. If passing this initiative doesn't hurt or help that, it simply just renders an, uh, an already in place system uh, uh, void in, in, in a sense because you've now taken half of the state or whatever portion of the, de the state decides against this initiative, voice away, and deciding that this entire state now decides that it's for this, whereas the representatives from their regions can decide that. But beyond that, money is a form of speech, and that's actually showing every day how we spend our dollars. We can choose or not choose to spend our money at certain places, so we can understand where that money goes. And that money then becomes our form of speech. That, then, that money then becomes the business's form of speech that we contribute to. If we don't want to do business with a certain group of people, we do not have to. We do not have to get in line with an individual's state of mind or uh, agenda, whether it be for reducing taxes or increasing taxes. That is for us to make up our mind, and this initiative, it goes against that in saying that uh, money is not a form of speech when it, it clearly is in through the form of donations that happen in political process. Any questions? Well, I hear what you're saying about um, one state cannot push the agenda for the nation. However, the nation is made up of 50 states and if delegations from individual states don't, I mean, okay, I think what I heard you saying was it's really up to, we should not be doing this through the initiative process, that we can put pressure on our representatives. We should be doing it through the representatives. Um, so you don't see this as a form of getting uh, a, a sort of a, a aggregate way of letting our representatives know what the people want? Uh, 
I do not. I think there's a clear venue for people to discuss issues with their representatives. Um, and if they don't understand what that is, there's definitely a lot of avenues, again, to go through seeking to speak with your representative or at least have your voice heard. Um, so there is already um, venues in place for voices uh, of the individuals and the voters to be heard. So to simply put this on an initiative and then say majority rules and that the people who disagree with this too bad, so sad, is almost the form of oppression. So, from what I'm, I'm hearing, you you want folks to, to use traditional avenues of, I guess, writing a letter to their congressperson, or is that what you're proposing? Right. And so, wouldn't, I, wouldn't you think that that would actually disenfranchise more people who may not have the time or um, the knowledge of how to use those traditional um, avenues, and instead the initiative might provide them a space to to voice their opinion without having to feel uh, either unwilling, unprepared, or um, unable to, to use what you're suggesting. Absolutely, so what you're, what you're suggesting is that people do not have enough information on how to vote and how to go about affecting the voting process. So maybe that's where the actual issue is, like this actual uh, thing right here, getting people involved in the voting process is the bigger issue, not the initiative. But that doesn't, so that, that is an issue. Yeah, people, people are disenfranchised issue, in, in, in that a that multitude of ways. So to simply say that people without time, well, that's, that's not to say that people without money don't have a lack of time as well. So what I, I, and that's not my position, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just play. I'm just sorry. Maybe if you want to clarify your question, I can try to answer. No, no, sorry. no. So I guess my 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 thought process is that this is just an additional way for folks to be able to tell their representative what it is they'd like to see, in addition to those more traditional forms of communication and that this doesn't necessarily supersede or make void any of the, the ways that you've discussed. But my, my contention with that is it would be voiding because it would be a majority rules also. It would be basically our voice as of Washington State would be against United Citizens United, whereas people in certain districts may feel for Citizens United. So you'd be disenfranchising those voter, voters and those representatives that feel that Citizens United is a uh, just call by the Supreme Court. Well, the measure actually says to, would urge the Washington State Congressional Delegation and not mandate. So this could be one piece of information that delegates would use in addition to the other information that they gleaned from their constituents. Well, what's but, really only coming out of this is a voice from Washington to Washington mm -hmm. saying that we want to we want to change this, whereas we use our state representatives to enact legislation all the time, and that's always the way that it's been done. If we want to change that, we want to change that to a more voting-based legislation that we decide on a federal level, then, then maybe that's an entirely new process we need to adjust, not necessarily be representative-based, be voter-based, and that's an entirely new system, and that's maybe what the initiative should have just addressed. I understand this is your assigned <laughs> position. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing a good job. Yeah. Yeah. They're doing a great job. This is, the, this is really good. So. The, the position, um, or I guess my question is, it's not, you know, it's, it's not an issue of um, the, the different um, forms of getting information out to people, because there have been other initiatives that have exactly done what this is doing. Mm -hmm. They've given the decision to the people to make. And so I, I, I guess that's why all these yeah. initiatives are on, even this whole issue regarding animals. Wait. But no, but I understand. But I think you guys did a real great job. So, <laughs> but you see, this is what it's like, right? So, this is what's happening in the state legislature for almost every issue that you can think of. So, I have a, um, a project for you. February 20th is uh, an equity rally day. It's, um, the schools are closed, and the, um, 
a lot of people are going to Olympia. They're going to link arms between the state legislature and the, uh, the state legislative building and the Supreme Court, and they're going to demand to fund, fully fund education. K you're talking K through 12. K through 12, yeah. OK? Uh, and the McCleary decision. So I ask you all to gather up some people. You can go in carloads, go in, you know, um, truckloads, whatever you do. Meet, meet me in Olympia and be part of this equity rally day. OK? All right. How many of you are willing to do that? We should get. We should get. Yeah, we should get. Going from yeah, here. we should get, get out there. <laughs> no, I. You know, I think we can. We can. Can we get a bus? Yeah. Oh, that I don't know. You know, we don't. I don't even think we have vans anymore. That's that's a whole financial <laughs> issue. Yeah. Well, anyway, carpool, carpool, because we're carpooling. But um, let me know. I will check in with Miss Kimberly to see how many of you are coming and how many of you I will meet over there. February 20th, okay? It's President's Day, so there's no school. I, I just want to say thank you so much, and I'll, I'll let you do the thing, but I just want to say one thing that I've learned from Velma. I've just met her during this election cycle, and I just love working with her. I've learned so much from her. And one of the things I've learned is it's not so much about, you know, election day. It's about all the time in between elections, and, and I think she's gotten that across today. It's the activism and working for change that's important. And the change is really important. If you really want to create change, you really need to be active. And it's not just like around voting, but understanding what the issues are, where you want to go on these issues, making your own decisions about them, and impacts your life. And then we create a revolution. Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Velma for her time. I will take the surveys as you leave, and please keep your voters' pamphlet and read up on the issues that you aren't maybe as clear about so that you can have a voice next week and going forward. Thank you so much, and have a great day.